I will start by saying um, I really miss going to DEF CONF in person. I see some familiar names on that attendee list. And you know, I remember in prior years, hanging out and talking to people. And um, it's tough, because every time I would leave the conference um, very energized, and um, it's just not the same <laughs> talking in a, like this. But I hope, uh, hope DEF CONF will happen in person again and get to see some of you guys. So what I want to talk about today is um, what's new in RPM stream, as the title says. Uh, and this is the 2020, 2022 edition. Um, you know, I've given some related talks to this at prior DEF CONF. And I know a lot of you come from a mix of backgrounds. Like some of you may not even know what this is. Some of you may use RPM based based systems. Um, you know, so I'm going to, uh, there's going to be a lot of ground covered. Uh, I want to try and save some time for questions because they're already coming in. So anyways, let's just uh, let's dive in. So I do like to start every talk. Um, who I am? Yeah, I'm Colin Walters. I work on Fedora and OpenShift, Red Enterprise Linux, um, the core OS ingredients go into those. Um, but I like to start every talk by talking about why I do what I do, because I think that's equally important. Um, I think it's sort of an uncontroversial fact that computers are essential to our society today, for better or worse. Um, my kind of, you know, one of my favorite examples of this today is if you're if you're growing um, grapes for wines, if you're running a vineyard, uh, today you might have a drone that's flying over your vineyard and you know it's taking pictures, um, maybe even has a, a thermal imaging camera and is assessing the heat, uh, the uh, the health of your your uh, grapes. And it's it's one of those things where yeah, and then you you take that data and you know you do analysis on it. It's just like a perfect example of like where computers are pervasive, right? Um, on manufacturing floors, everywhere. I think everyone knows this. Um, and I think free and open source software is really essential to making sure that we have control of the computers and not the other way around. Um, you know, there's the rise of proprietary cloud services and, you know, we can't escape using some of those, but I like to work on free and open source software because it helps, helps us make sure that, yeah, we're in control of this foundation for our society. So. How does that translate, though, into this OS tree? Um, how does it translate into what I do for Enterprise Linux? So if your business or your personal life is involves computers, right? you have data in there that's important to you. You have things that those computers do that need to run. And unfortunately, computers have flaws. Software has flaws. Um, like one example is there's been flaws in the Linux kernel Bluetooth stack, right? So you could even be vulnerable to a drive-by attack where you know, someone just has a device that's out there trying to exploit the Bluetooth stack and just drives by your, your place of business, maybe that vineyard earlier, and happens to exploit your kernel and, and take it over. And then maybe you're in a ransomware scenario, right? Not even, you weren't even directly targeted. It's just, you know, it's just something that just sort of happened, right? Because, because yeah, computers have flaws. So keeping your OS up to date is the best thing that we can do here. I mean, obviously we have, there's a lot of other things to do. Um, you know, you can turn off Bluetooth for one thing, but so applying OS updates is critical. I like to think that we've, we're making computers better more than we're making them worse overall. And if you're running a computer, you know, you want to apply an OS update in such a way that it's not going to take down what's running. So what OS3 does is it basically constructs a new route that doesn't affect what's currently running. So it's very different from like traditional package systems. It's, it's more of an image system. And that happens in the background and you, you, uh, you take a reboot. Um, I'll talk about live OS changes a little bit later. And there's some links in here, it's image-based. So you know if you're running, especially a core OS-based system, we build an image in our CI and we test that in the cloud. You know, For example, we verify that we can run Podman containers in Google Compute Engine and Azure. And then only then once that CI has passed, that image ships to your system. And you're running exactly something that's tested. Um, something very similar is true of OpenShift 4 too. Um, there's a lot of other things going on here. You know, separating applications into containers helps um, helps make sure that you can apply those kernel security updates faster. For example, um, getting GCC and developer tools out of your workstation's root file system is just a good idea because it'll let you Oh, update the OS faster. But so we just sort of live in a duality here between RPM OS tree and OS tree. OS tree is a little bit more like Docker or Podman. It, it's agnostic to what you put in it. 
Um, the idea of RPM Oyster here is that it has really tight integration with the RPM ecosystem. For example, um, one of my favorite examples here is it's not a lockdown system by default. So if at some point you need to test a new kernel, you can take the same kernel RPM that comes out of the Fedora build system and override that locally, right? You can say RPM Oyster override replace kernel. And that's a first class operation to test and replace parts of that base image because it's essential to, yeah, having you be in control of your computer. Um, so, yeah, there's a bunch of places that uh, RPM Oyster is used today. The first two are products from my employer, Red Hat. Um, RHEL for Edge is designed to make custom um, images in many different forms, it supports uh, outputting um, RPM Oyster. There's a lot we could talk about that. Uh, I will mostly skip that for now. Um, OpenShift 4, uh, we, we basically encapsulate OS updates in a container. Um, I'm not going to talk about that too much today either. Uh, Fedora Silverblue is you know, a desktop-based system. Um, and uh, yeah, there's a bunch of derivatives. Yeah, and briefly touching on the OS3 aspect again, I try really hard to have, work on general tooling. So OS3 is, is a is software that can be used outside of RPM-based distributions, right? Again, it's agnostic to what's put in it. And there's a pretty big user base for it. Um, people are using it um, with Debian-based operating systems, Open Embedded, slash Octo, um, a bunch of things I don't even know about. Um, and, and actually, I've been kind of trying to drain some of the higher level logic out of RPM OS3 and into OS3 slowly. Um, that's gotten easier with Rust. Uh, cool. So. Some of you may have known most of that. So I want to talk about what's new. Um, this OS3 native containers change is definitely one of the biggest things uh, that's been happening in the last year. So that's what I'm going to talk about the most. I'm, I'm going to skip it. I'll circle back to that in a minute. Um, I'm very excited, though, to, to note that we've been increasing our usage of Rust um, because, yeah, you know, applying, applying and managing operating system updates sort of demands you really want your code base to be fast and efficient, and you want it to be memory safe so you're not subject to buffer overflows and all those classic type of things. So, so Rust has really helped us out here. Um, it's all we could touch on here because we've invested a lot in bridging between C and Rust um, and stuff like that because we can't rewrite everything either. Uh, another thing that's happened in the last year, in case you missed it, is RPM OS3 now has full support for modularity that mostly fell out of the fact that a lot of the modularity logic drained from DNF into libdnf, which RPM Oyster uses, but there is a lot of other details there. Um, so that's there. One of the things that was cool uh, is someone just showed up and um, did this very cool patch for um, making sure that the RPM database inside the build is reproducible. He basically went through and uh, fixed all the time embedded timestamps there. Um, with someone who just kind of showed up one day with a giant patch and it was very good code. That's one of the things I love about working on free and open source software is that that time when someone just shows up with a big cool patch like that. Um, what is that person doing with RPM Oyster? I have no idea. Uh, there is the change to the SQLite RPM database. A lot of details there around supporting cross builds, like where we run RPM Oyster in a Fedora container and then generate rel content. So we need to have the new RPM Oyster would be still be able to output the old Berkeley DB format. I think we spent at least at least a solid week talking on and off about system D and rebooting. You know, circling back to that automatic OS update scenario where you're automatically rebooting periodically. If you have a scenario where you say, you know, you need to hold an OS update uh, briefly, how do you do that? What's the best pattern, right? Like you need to you need to debug something on that node or machine. You need to you need uptime for just the weekend suddenly because you got some birth of traffic. Um, what we ended up settling on is uh, system D inhibitors. So if you have RP mostly automatic upgrades on, you can type system D inhibit and that will block that upgrade um, because of historical reasons for system D. This is opt in, um, so we had to do some work. DNF count me. Uh, another cool thing uh, I'm pretty excited was in 2021.1 release, the first release of 2021, uh, we rewrote the apply live code. So 
when you talk about duality, RPM OS3, yeah, supports OS3 and RPMs. That's one of the dualities. It is an image-based system, but it also we also invest a lot in being able to cherry pick um, and apply live changes to your running root file system in a safe way. Um, so again, in case you missed it, you can now type RPM OS3 install dash A, some package, and that should generally work. Um, yeah, another cool thing is we actually switched uh, to being the main function is now Rust code, and the and it basically the rest of the logic that was there before is now a C plus plus library, um, C and C plus plus actually, which is its own story. Uh, there's a lot of work in reworking the build system there around auto tools and a bunch of stuff. Um, I hope eventually the build system you just type cargo build and it'll work. Okay, so this is prop. So that's a bunch of other stuff that's happened. Um, but I, I know there has been a lot of interest in, in this OS tree native containers. So the way I like to summarize this is, yeah, what you see up here at this very front is like, it's sort of what you, you can write a Docker file that looks like this today, where you take our base image, add some content, add some binaries, maybe it's extra packages, maybe it's something else, add configuration, and then you can boot it. So the, you build it as a container, the output is a container, um, but then you just type RPM history rebase and it can pull that container. And we'll dive in this more. So why are we doing this though? Um, one answer here is that I think we've been fairly successful so far with the strategy of keeping your container host small and running your workloads as containers. That's generally worked out well. But there's there's a lot of cases that are in between where people have security scanners or agents um, and things like that. So basically by, and we want to keep supporting that. Like if you're a happy user of one of these RPM history systems today, we're not going to break anything. I'll touch on that too. But if you want to do non-trivial customization, we're giving you a lot more power with this um, and more responsibility. So. Yeah, this is basically bridging bridging the worlds of configurability is the way I like to think about it. Like you, we're giving you a new way to, to configure things. Um, another bridge that was created as part of this effort is um, in the container ecosystem, Go is obviously very popular. Um, Go really wants to be the only thing in your address space. Mixing Go and C and C++ is not the best. Um, and so I really struggled with this for a long time because in the OS3 stack, we've been investing a lot in Rust. And we have, for example, libRPM is C. It's just not going to change tomorrow, right? Um, and I didn't want to link in Go. So basically, what we ended up doing, yeah, you know, if you click on this link, you can find more to the more, but basically we there's a new uh, IPC mechanism for the containers go container slash image library, basically as part of the Scopio binary. And so RPM OSG now, now knows how to fork off Scopio and, and delegate a lot of the pulling container stuff to Scopio. Um, just as one example, uh, in the containers ecosystem, there's good support for GPG signatures of containers. Um, there's good support for like mirroring. And basically, we want all that. Um, we don't want to rewrite the container stack. Um, we want to leverage what exists while still being able to use it for OS updates. Um, yeah, the current proxy is basically between Rust and Go, but nothing stops you from writing, say, Python code that talks to this proxy. Uh, OK, so yeah, I sort of mentioned this before. So we're kind of rethinking of RPM OS3, and especially OS3, as like we're producing a base image that you can boot. And I really have to emphasize, we've built up a lot in the OS tree and especially RPM OS tree stack. Like, so for example, you have client side overrides. I touched on the RPM OS tree install stuff. I touched on the fact that you can replace your kernel when you need to. All that is going to keep working. If you're, fact, if you're using OS tree today, it's going to keep working. We're not dropping anything. Um, if you're using OS tree for an embedded system and using OS tree's really efficient static deltas, it's going to keep working. Okay, but what we've done is add a whole other backend, basically. So 
I am hopeful, though, as part of this effort, if it works out, that we will switch probably Fedora and the derivatives to use this new, to use containers on the wire instead of OS3 on the wire. And there's a lot of stuff involved in that. Um, one cool thing, and I'll, I'll demo this later, is it now actually becomes much more first class to add in custom non-RPM content into your booted OS. Uh, and it also, yeah, also talk about binding configuration and code. Um, one thing that could be its own whole subtalk of course is, if you haven't kept track, there's a lot of RPM industry stuff going on in Fedora. We could actually rethink of things, how we build things so that, for example, Fedora Core S, or maybe some part of Fedora Core S, was actually used as a layer, and then the desktops were built from it. Um, should the desktops have a common base image layer? A lot of interesting stuff going on there um, that we could do with this. So probably one of the things you're wondering is, I got to emphasize all this code exists and works today. Like There's links here from the tutorial. You can try it out. Um, but there's stuff that's not implemented. Um, for example, one of those things is we don't garbage collect container image layers yet. So container image layers will just continue to you know, sit on your system unless you kind of manually prune them later. Um, and we've discussed shifting some of the logic for what happens at build time actually to be inside the container. So one example of this is today, like OS3 and RPM OS3 have first class integration with SE Linux. And we do the labeling on the client side today, but that's really ugly. That involves running through thousands of regular expressions for every file. We basically want to move that to the container build time, um, basically to yeah shift the OS tree stuff that happens to the build time. Um, that'll probably just involve a command you need to run in your Docker file or equivalent. OK, uh, yeah, this is me trying real hard to express something very detailed in a single slide and clearly failing. But let's dive in. So if you're using Fedora Core OS, or, or OpenShift for today, like there's this idea that we ship a tested image. That's, that's the code aspect of this. That's the slash user file system. And then what you do is you take our tested image and you configure it, right? And you have your data, which we have nothing to do with your data, right? We're not going to break your home directory or you know, uh, your container images, all that stuff. So there, yeah, you per machine typically configure this image. Yeah, and I touched on that here. So for example, you could use Anaconda to configure this image um, or Ignition with Fedora Core OS, that sort of thing. So the thing that's new here, and I think it's going to be really interesting, is that now it's much easier to bind exactly version together the binaries with the configuration. So and an example here is, let's say you want to add USB guard into your OS, and you want to have a specific configuration for USB guard or anything else, right? Maybe it's your configuration, your mirroring configuration for Podman. Um, maybe it's your TLS uh, configuration for the, for the host OS. Now what happens if you build a container with this, you can add configuration into Etsy. And then when you type RPM Street upgrade, you get exactly that pairing of configuration and code together as an atomic unit. And which just wasn't really possible before. Like another way to think of this is it's now much easier to sort of transactionally update Etsy too, which a lot of people have wanted. Um, and yeah, as I touch on here, this is a big change between what we um, currently, you know, how we're currently handling things with say Anaconda-based systems or Ignition-based systems, that sort of type of thing. Um, yeah, this idea of Nixos has a lot of cool things going on. This whole talk could be about like what, what ideas we could steal from them. Um, but I just want to mention it's they they also sort of try and bind this configuration of your system along with the code. Um, yeah, and the OpenShift MCO also tries to do this, um, and sort of people try and do this with Ansible too. Okay, so yeah, I sort of touched on this before. Here's a user story. You build your container, and then and then you just boot it, right? So you run this command is what it looks like. And what's going on with this OS3 unverified registry thing 
is I'm sort of of the opinion, very strongly of the opinion, that your containers that you boot should be signed. And this is making clear it's not. So one of the OS3 things that we're carrying forward is actually OS3 has first class support for GPG signatures. And we can actually, we today embed that GPG signature inside the Fedora core OS image and can verify it client side. So that's not something the container stack does. We're not using the container stack signature stuff yet, um, but we will in the future um, as well. And then, so the idea is, yeah, you boot that container for your system or you know, uh, array of systems, you can enable automatic upgrades. And then, then let's say you want to make a change, right? You go into your Docker file. We're actually trying to also work on a declarative build system, which is its own whole subtopic I haven't uh, touched on here. And then, um, then yeah, you can just enable automatic upgrades. We'll probably uh, also make it much easier to take that container and wrap like a bootable disk image shell around it, like a VMware OVA or an, a bare metal ISO or an AMI, Azure image, all that type of stuff um, that Image Builder does. So yeah, I'll just get past the alternative history, but this is like one way I've been trying to describe this is like, if we just made it so yum natively understood how to boot containers, like this, all this RPM mystery stuff. I don't, I, I don't know whether that makes sense. So. Here's what's going to happen. Um, there's a lot that still needs to happen. I mentioned the garbage collection bug. Um, but yeah, this is what I've been doing for a while, and I'm, we're pretty committed to it. Um, there's, yeah, another thing that definitely needs to happen is right now we have like this embryonic implementation where we basically take the whole OS3 commit and we just turn it into a single giant tarball. Um, Container images are basically tarballs wrapped with JSON. Um, and this pull request that's in flight is basically breaking up it up into a series of content address layers, which means that you don't need to re-download when there's a kernel security update, you don't need to re-download everything. Um, so that's going to happen. Uh, and that will, I think, be the number one thing that will make this practical for many more use cases, like outside of like a data center where you have fast networking. Um, I do want to get a apply live out of experimental, continuing our oxidation. Um, the rethinking origins is actually another Nix thing um, where we basically want to have like a YAML file in Etsy instead of typing our premaster install foo. You actually edit a file and then declare to say rebuild to my desired state. Um, and that's actually happening as part of this container stuff. Um, if you want to contribute to this stack, you know, um, be happy to help. Uh, mentor people. There's a very friendly group of people behind all this. Um, so yeah, we're hoping to make this happen in 2022. So actually, where am I in time? In my session chair will say. Um, I definitely want to leave time for questions. So yeah, uh, if you want more thing. links. Hmm? Yeah, I think you're on thing. OK, still on time. All right, so um, yeah, there's a bunch more information. Uh, I've been trying to drop in. Um, like announcements into this uh, into this bugzilla. Um, there's a lot more stuff. So just to reiterate again, most of the container stuff is actually happening in the new OS tree Rust code. So again, we're trying to still support using non RPM content in there, non RPM, no RPMs at all, whether that's Debs or whether that's you know open embedded or something else. Um, but then RPM OS tree will kind of bind this stuff together with uh, with the RPM ecosystem. So I know that was a big dump of information, um, and I'm hoping that you guys uh, have your questions. So I will stop sharing my screen. Yep, we have a bunch of questions. Actually, there was an amazing conversation going on in the chat as well. Uh, okay. I would like to begin with uh, a question that popped in early. Just. How much does um, the oxidation affect OS tree's binary size? From yeah. yeah, so that's a great question. Um, in the OS tree community, like I mentioned, there's a lot of embedded users, and they were very conservative. Like they basically had invested in supporting C toolchains, C and C plus plus, and you know, there's a lot of cross compilation, which Rust supports as well. But it's it's a big thing, and um, so the OS3 core has mostly been unchanged. The OS3 C library, 
So the user bin OS3 binary and the, the C shared library do not include Rust code today. Okay, so you can use it without Rust. All the new logic basically links to it using the Rust bindings. But I would like, and basically all the, so what happens is we didn't want to duplicate all the Rust logic between OS3 and RPM OS3. So basically RPM OS3 has all the Rust stuff, even though on Fedora systems at least. There's a lot of details there, but um, I'm trying not to break existing OS2 users, if that makes sense. Uh, there was, I think you can go through the chat as well. There has been some interesting discussion going on around. I'll pick up the question from Q&A. Um, Neil Gompa asks, are there any example scripts of how to create an RPM OS3 commit and wrap it as a container image? Yes, yes. Um, I guess I can just share my screen, but it's in, um, yeah, if you have an RPM OS3 commit, you basically type OS3 container encapsulate. I, mean, I guess I could share my screen and demo this too, but it is, it's in the docs. I, um, yeah, uh, I'll, I'll dig up a link. So yes, that's fully supported. And like, I gotta, I guess I should emphasize, we're trying to do this really carefully. We're not throwing away what works today because a lot of stuff does work. Um, so the build system can just, if you have something that outputs an OS3 commit today, you can just use the tooling and, and convert it to a container uh, losslessly. And then you can unencapsulate it basically back into an OS3 commit that's GPG signed and all that stuff. Okay, great. Uh, the question we have from Martin Coleman is, do you know about OS3 being used on mobile devices or mobile OSs based on OS3? Seems like a uh, perfect fit for robust update on mobile devices? Um, for mobile, like, yeah, especially mobile phone type things. Um, you know, I think it's hard to overstate the 800 pound gorilla of Android in that ecosystem. Um, you know, I think, uh, so no is the short answer to this. Um, I think it's, yeah, people are, Android though really is oriented towards things that have a user interface. Um, and so I think where people are using OS3 type systems more is headless embedded, like the IoT type space. Um, competing in the mobile phone market is a whole other challenge, I think. Okay, great. I think we have three minutes over time with the questions, but Chat has been interesting. Cool. Yeah, sorry. I'm just still trying to scroll through this. So um, I think this is actually the last talk. Um, so I'm I'm happy to hang out. I know for some of the, you guys in Europe, you may have been up for a while and want to go. But um, oh, actually, there is the wrap up. But I'll hang out after. And um, you know, uh, if anyone wants to chat. Um, you know, you can catch me on Fedora Devel, on Matrix, uh, Fedora, um, also on Fedora CoS on Matrix, um, and yeah, I'll be around in, in the DevConf. So that's about it. Thank you for the Thank amazing session. Coming. It was a whole lot of great information for us. <laughs> Thanks again. Thanks. Bye-bye. Thanks, everyone. Thanks to the lovely audience here.